Ahoy, ahoy. Welcome to Head Game, the science and psychology of sports. Our guest today is Eric Sogard. He is a real-life Major League Baseball player, most recently playing infield with the Milwaukee Brewers. He's currently a free agent. Eric, welcome to Head Games. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for joining us from uh, sunny Phoenix. So, okay, out with it. You're a free agent. We got to know any preferences or, or any hints on where you might sign? No preferences. I, I always say any team is a good team to be on. I've been playing for a while now. I've been able to bounce around a few teams and just need to experience the different organizations, different groups of players. And just it's been, it's been fun bouncing around for sure. So I'm happy to be out there just continuing to play the game that I love and, you know, having fun doing it. Nice. You've you've primarily, I think, spent a career playing with like analytics heavy teams like Brewers and A's and Rays. I think there's something to be said about the role that either you have crafted for your career or the role that these teams have crafted, right? A lot of times you've been you've been platoon split. Do you have a preference towards playing full time or platoon, or you're just like, you know, whatever will be, will be? Obviously, number one is however I can help the team is is why I'm there. I think Obviously, a goal for for every player is to be an everyday player, get the opportunity to go out every single day and and just go play. So it can, it can be more challenging being a platoon guy, not knowing each day you're going to start, not knowing what position. So it takes a little more to stay prepared, stay ready, and you know that's something I've kind of come accustomed to throughout my career, and I think it's. It's helped me. It's helped the longevity of my career as well. I'm having that versatility and being able to manage playing multiple positions and being, you know, staying ready for, for any time. Yeah. You, so we're, we're psychologists, right? So can you talk a little bit more about the, the mental side of that preparation of, of what it takes to really be ready to jump in at any moment's notice to pinch hit or play right. third or second or wherever you're going to hop in? For sure. It's it's very different. And it's something, especially as young players getting into the big leagues, it's something that it takes time to adjust because a lot of these younger kids coming up are, are prospects, young studs. They're you know playing every day down the minor leagues and now they get up to the big leagues and, and they're playing twice a week. They, hmm. They've gone now five days without having a live at bat and now they got to get up there and, and face major league pitching, the best pitching they've ever seen in their life. So it's certainly challenging because there's times that that you you go out there on that day whatever game five where you haven't played in a while and, and now you want to do more so mm-hmm. you're trying a little a little harder and and often things don't go the way you want them to go it usually <laughs> takes a few at bats to to get your timing and rhythm back and then the game's over and now you're sitting for another three days so mm-hmm. it can definitely be a mental roller coaster there so it's it's finding ways to stay prepared to stay game ready and really get your work in whether for me it was maybe standing in on some pitch pitchers bullpen so I can mm. continue to see that live pitching even though I'm not playing every day and really defensive wise getting my work in at, at every single position just to stay prepared because yeah there's there's really times you you don't know coaching staff does a great job of doing their best to give you a good heads up of where you could possibly play but you don't know and especially in the National League other than this past year <laughs> where double switches are occurring at any given time in the game, you you always have to stay mentally and physically ready. So that's something I've been able to find my routine, find times where I'm not going, likely not going to be needing the game so I can go kind of prepare and get my work done inside and then be ready for, for when that time comes, if it does come. Yeah. And I think mentally you, you've had, you've had that challenge. And I think most recently last season, because primarily you were split between second and shortstop. And then last year, it seemed like you played a bunch of third base where more often than not, you weren't at, you weren't at third so right okay i i have to i have to do this so as ben mentioned it's a psychology show and we're not clinicians but this is going to be your rorschach test i'm just going to throw out some potential landing spots you don't have to respond but i'm just going to read your face and see if this is <laughs> something i think it'd be cool to have you back in oakland i think they need a lefty at third although i heard they might resign with stella i'm not sure about that but i think that'd be a cool landing spot the indians have an opening at second there's nobody playing second base i don't think they resigned i don't know what's going on with Hernandez. And I think speaking of the Bay Area and Ben and I are both from the Bay Area, we're big Giants fans. I could see in the Giants as well. I think they need a lefty you can play second. That. that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I think you passed the Rorschach. I'm, I'm trying to read it, Ben. Did you get anything from him? No, man. You you have a good you have a good poker face. 
I'll say I'm a that. decent poker player. I was going to say I'm a decent <laughs> poker player. So I can, we we I play tell. we play once in a while on on the on the plane trip during nice. the season. So I've been known to win a few games. <laughs> For good reason, obviously, you're good good at bluffing. Clearly, <laughs> no, but yeah, like I said, any team is a good team. I I truly enjoyed my time in the Bay Area and was able to spend the first six years of my big league career in Oakland, which was truly amazing. Great group yeah. of guys, and then in 2019 when I was playing in Toronto, there were a couple of trade rumors of possible we go into San Fran as well so hmm. family and I love the Bay Area love playing there great fans so obviously if, if that were to happen we would not be disappointed one bit cool yeah. good to hear so I think something else that we're we're interested in and, and there's been an issue across sports has been the effect of COVID and one thing that I think we really wanted to hone in on is your decision making process around playing this past season and also this upcoming season and obviously family something is important to you congrats by the way I saw you and your wife just adopted two more kids so huge congratulations on that and I'm sure as you're aware Buster Posey adopted a couple of kids as well right before the season started last year, decided to opt out for good reason. Did you have any kind of thought process around that as you were weighing the risk of playing versus what risk that might bring on to affecting your family? Like, What kind of thought process did you have around that? Well, obviously, my wife and I discussed it quite a bit, but we were both very comfortable with going through the season. And obviously, it was a lot of new ground for, for everybody. And we didn't quite know how we were going to do it or what we were going to do. And obviously, the family wasn't able to go to games at all or, or travel much so they were kind of stuck at home but we're we've been blessed with with healthy children so luckily we didn't have kind of any reason to kind of be too worried about that so but it was it was definitely a challenge I think one of the most challenging things being a ball player kind of going through the the pause of spring training was kind of the unknown of of mm-hmm. when we were going to get back started because you know as, as ball players we have a schedule you know we have a set schedule we have we know the amount of time we need to prepare to for that start date and and we're ready and during that that pause period it was kind of an unknown where guys were like weren't sure of of where to stay at with their physical or mental status because they really didn't have a a start point so it's like uh, are we just in the middle of the off season are we going to be starting up in two weeks is is very challenging to kind of kind of navigate as as someone who is so schedule oriented and it's kind of laid out in front of you that you can prepare for so well so that was that was certainly a challenging thing for for me along with a lot of other ball players for sure yeah ben and i are both dads and so i think we were talking off air about, you know, what that decision might be like. So we definitely empathize with the the difficulty in the decision making along the lines of just, I think, being a major league baseball player in general. And I think being away from your family during non-pandemic seasons and the decisions that, you know, must go through. So I I think looking back on this season, it seemed very experimental given everything that was going on with COVID. And I think the league did some interesting things, right? There was a universal DH and there was other actions that the league was going through to kind of spice the game up a little bit. I think the idea and the goal based Based on maybe it's data that they've got to attract a younger audience and try different things. As a player, you know, what do you think? Like, do you have any ideas about uh, attracting a younger audience or anything like that that from a player's perspective might be interesting? Yeah, I think one of the things that's been neat to see coming out is all the kind of analytics and all just kind of the, the extra stuff they can put on, on TV along with the games <laughs> instead of just watching the games. It's, it's neat to have that kind of aspect where people who are more interested can can dive into there and, and the kids can kind of follow along and learn because you you truly see the shift in the game of, of how much the analytics are taking over and I believe there will be a bit of a plateau eventually but this all this technology is so awesome and, and so neat that I think there's no reason it can't hurt most everybody it's just finding a way to use it to benefit you to bring out your best ability so I think you know the way they can use that throughout the games and, and continue to teach Teach the young children and I think that's something that's that's been neat and, and can continue to help for sure yeah that does seem like it it makes the game more accessible in a different way right Get, baseball has always been about stats I mean when I was right. a kid I was reading the box scores in the newspaper that my dad got every day right the San Francisco Chronicle and now it's still about stats but it's just approached this obviously totally different level can you give us a little bit of insight into how 
the analytics affects your kind of everyday playing life? Like what kind of stuff are you seeing on a daily basis? Yeah, and like once again, it's been a transition period from beyond in my career. It was, I'm sure a lot of the organizations were, were using it to their own extent, but a lot of the players were just kind of doing their own thing and, mm-hmm. and going out and playing ball like we like we had our whole life. Just being able to use the amount of information and use it to to your benefit is, is biggest. I remember first getting up to the big leagues and having all the the numbers, the stats of when I'm studying for the starting pitcher that day and, and just seeing all these numbers, 2-1 count, 90% of the time throwing a slider and it's just all this stuff. So, so I'm, oh, okay, okay, I can use this. You know, I'll get one up there. Oh, 2-1 count. Oh, 90. Okay, slider, slider. Fastball down the middle. <laughs> Probably would have been a good pitch to hit. So, so again, that was kind of a learning curve for me to kind of learn to take what I needed to help me on a daily basis. And mm. for me, it was more learning the velocities and the movement of, of the pitcher, of his pitches, and almost leaving it there, not going too far into depth. Because when I, I learn for myself anyways, when I'm in the box and I start running through numbers and, and stuff in my head, that's that's not where I'm going to be able to compete and, and perform to my best ability. So everybody, everybody's different. Uh, but there is so much information out there. I think it takes time for players to learn what benefits them most to to put them in the best position to succeed on the field. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And I think it would be difficult, as you said, to be trying to make all these machinations between different numbers while also trying to hit a 97 plus mile an hour fastball, right? It seems like everybody's right, 100, right. 100 now. So how do you, you know, right. kind of balance those things? Seems like it would be, it would be really yeah. tough. And then you think about, I think about how I was raised in the game and it was never on all the research and stats behind who you're facing. It's just, hey, yeah. hey, these are the pitches he has. Now go up, get a strike yeah. and, and try and crush it. So yeah. So obviously it's different now. Maybe the kids nowadays are, are have more of these analytic based scouting reports that they can go to and but they can they can incorporate that early and understand what works for them and, yeah. and continue to build off that. Yeah. I remember a coach years ago telling me I played baseball in, in college. I remember coach years ago telling me basically it was see ball hit ball right like you just get up there you tr- see what the pitcher's throwing because you try to recognize if it's a slider or it's a fastball it's a change up or whatever and you try to hit the damn thing like like you said and obviously that that's changed a lot over the years it has but I, I promise you there's still players out there that and I know I've played with a few where come hitter meeting time they're plugging their mm. ears because they don't want to hear a thing they want to just get up there compete and literally see ball hit ball just like yeah. they had done their whole yeah. life so yeah a lot of it it can be it can be too much thought in the box and that can be uh, detrimental to some some hitters for sure yeah makes sense so we, we recently talked with a current MLB agent and he had a player who was on the Brewers for a while and he told us that in his estimation the Brewers had as a team the best mental health and it was because they had some psychologists on staff and all these other things. You played for the Brewers. Do you have a take on that? I mean, was that, did you find that to be true? Can you compare and contrast the sort of mental health emphasis and also mental health of, of the various teams you've been on? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of teams nowadays are starting to kind of really focus on that side and realize the importance of it. And, you know, Brewers do a great job with that. They do. And, you know, they, their organization does a great job of just taking care of their players just on and off the field, just trying to really make everything as, as smooth and, and effortless as possible so they can really focus everything on, on their game and, and make sure they're feeling good. And But I experienced, you know, very similar with, with Toronto and Tampa with, with their their mental health guys. And it, it honestly, it helped me because I feel like players, like we, we understand that side to that we want that. We want that. We want that mindfulness. But I feel like we never been taught to get there in a way it's always just hey just just do it but it's like I'll try to do it but (laughs) so in in Toronto especially for me whether it was once or twice a week just getting with with our mental coach and just kind of running through mindfulness techniques just to kind of clear the mind and allow you to be in the present moment was was really something special to me and I noticed it day and night and getting on the field and and being able to just kind of let the past go don't worry about the future and and really focus on the moment and yeah it's definitely something as a young player in the big leagues is something you struggle with you're playing against the best in the in the world may not be playing every day 
you may not be playing well. And now you got thoughts, are they going to send me down tomorrow? I don't know. Is the next day going to be it? It's like Mm -hmm. definitely challenging. So having ways to be able to clear your mind and and put yourself in the present moment and just, and just go at it. The game you worked at your whole life and has, it's truly something that's, that's special and, and that players, you know, work toward. It's just finding ways to, to get there for them. Yeah. We, we had a, a, a Mets minor league pitcher on our, on our pod a couple of months ago, Connor O'Neill, who was saying, I, I love the way that he described it. It's sort of the pessimistic view, but baseball is a game of failure. And he was talking about the idea of, you know, the locker room can be a tough place. And like, hey, put a round bat on a round ball is not something easy to do. It is nice to hear that you mentioned, whether it be, you know, the Jays, the Brewers or otherwise, that these these resources are available to players. So us being psychologists, we, we're biased to it. <laughs> I think as human beings, I think we, I think we like seeing that. So that's really good. You talk about these. So you've been on these analytics heavy teams. And I love this idea of the organization investing in, in players and investing in the team and just being conscious of this. Would you say, and we've heard this, I don't know if this is true, but a lot of these teams tend to prioritize clubhouse dynamics and find these kind of glue guys, right? And speaking about what Connor had mentioned, the difficulties that the clubhouse can be. Did you find the atmosphere on some of these teams that you played with generally lighter? I know it's hard to compare because maybe you didn't play for other types of team, but maybe compared to like a college team or something like that. How is the atmosphere, you know, for these for these teams that prioritize clubhouse? Yeah, well, I'd actually compare closer to college than 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 not because that's one thing. I went to Arizona State, and that was the biggest thing that we were built on was was literally family and brotherhood and, and picking up the guy next to you. And I, as you get into professional ball and higher up, become slightly more individual because everyone's paid on an individual basis and individual performance. But I think, like you said, these these analytical driven teams who who look for character and chemistry, they do a good job of, of really finding players that, that fit that mold. And when, like, when we were in Oakland, man, we had some great group of guys hmm that just came together and and love going to battle every single day for each other and i think it's special because honestly there are times when you know that's that's certainly not the case but that's the reason why we were able to win against against teams payrolls three or four times more because you know we came together it's still a team game in the end it's like yes you can go out and buy nine superstars but i tell you what you got nine guys on the same page going to battle together and you got nine individual superstars i mean it's going to be an interesting battle you'd be surprised who's going to come out on top most of the time so that's one thing that i've seen in these organizations that do a really good job of of finding pieces here and there and, and bring them together and when you get everyone on board and understanding their role and position it's when certain certainly powerful things can happen i'm I'm totally geeking out right now because a big area of study for me was team chemistry. And it, it, it's you know referenced oftentimes as an intangible and it's referenced as something like magical and whatever, but it is, it's great to hear from a player's perspective that it is a powerful mechanism, right? That as you said, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts that comparing a team that's built around chemistry versus a team that's built around payroll, the two can compete with each other. So validation, <laughs> feeling good. <laughs> there you, you go. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you're talking sweet nothings into Brent here, basically, by talking good about team chemistry, because this is like, this is his baby. I mean, he, he spent, whatever, seven years working on this stuff for his dissertation, sort of the, the psychology and science of team chemistry. I and mean, we're actually putting together a book with some other psychologists around that same topic, because as you said, it's, it's essential to the success of a team, and it can really help equalize the playing field when there are those disparities around payroll and, and other stuff. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what, what are some of the, I guess, things that you've noticed being in various clubhouses that make a team cohesive make a team come together is it driven by the coaches is it driven by the players is it the organization like what are some of those factors yeah it's a little both but i think it again it starts with with the front office going out and and really kind of understanding the players and that they're taking in not only as baseball players but as as people and and how they're how they are and for me like what i went through in college at Arizona State and, and, and building that brotherhood and kind of understanding what it was like, you know, it was truly, truly something special. And I know I wouldn't be where I am today without going through that experience and just growing how much I did. I think it's helped me sure land on some of these teams that that look for that. And it's a long season, the baseball season. So to be, to be able to be around guys that you can mesh with and lean your head against when you're struggling, guys that will pick you up, it's enormous thing. So it's, it's truly 
pretty special when you do have that. And I always say, once you get in the playoffs, like that's when you really see all that come out because everyone's salaries are done. They, mm-hmm. they got their money now. Again, we're back to just like college. The only thing that matters is winning. So it's, it's doing whatever it takes to win, to help your team win. And all the extra BS is off to the side now. It's, it's literally the only thing that matters. And that's when it becomes the real game that we, that we all love again, for sure. Mm, very cool. Well, we obviously are big nerds and we, we love your, your Twitter, bi- Twitter bio, by the way. So we have sort of a funny question for you, which is, do you have a Hall of Fame nerdiest MLB players? And it can include yourself if you if you want it to. But are there other, are there other guys who you would put in there with you? We should also state the nickname first, that when you were playing in Oakland, the fans gave you right. name, I think. Yes. Yes, they gave me yes. the nickname. Yeah, Nerd Power. Nerd Power. Yeah. There you go. It stuck with me throughout my career. I think it was 2013 when the passionate fans in right field blessed me with that beautiful <laughs> it took me a little while to embrace it i'm not gonna lie but no it yeah. is, it's it's been awesome those fans are absolutely fantastic and then it's, it's followed me throughout my career so it's been it's been fun but i'm trying to think other hall of fame players put on that list one of my good buddies sam folds very intelligent mm-hmm. in the game he's moving his way up in front offices now mm-hmm. which is neat to see awesome uh, there's some sneaky some sneaky guys out there that certainly dive deep into the mental side which is which is neat and i think it's a very important part of this game which is which is fun to see it's fun to see that it's being understood more and 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 worked on more just because it really is a lot of my teammates we always talk about how it, it feels like it's talent getting to the big leagues is is about 10 percent of of what it actually takes to to stay in the big leagues and the rest is is truly is truly mental and your ability to persist through the challenges and it is a wild mental ride so being able to handle it and and put yourself in the best position possible to to go to battle against it is is truly i think what's what's helped me the most to stay there for sure yeah we put this show together i think to bring light to sports psychology and to bring psychology to the to the i guess popular sports conversation and i think a goal is to educate other people but time and time again i think ben and i are also leave educated by speaking to our guests and i have to say the same thing with this episode i think it was great lending your perspective from a personal level and things that you've leaned on in terms of psychology, but also the dynamics in the clubhouse and everything. It has been a great, great time with you on the show. We can't thank you enough. Are you, you're on Twitter? I'm on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. You want people Instagram, to follow you so. on Twitter? What's your, yeah. what's your handle? Eric Sogard something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they can find, they can find, find, they can find you. They can search my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can throw it on. That's fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. Appreciate it. Hey, yeah. thank you guys. That was fun. That was awesome. Thanks, Eric. Take care, man. Please write to you guys. Show me where applicable. Thanks as always for our editing team for putting together today's show. You can find us on Twitter at Head Game Psych. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Brett Levine. And you can find that guy on Twitter at BD Rosenberg PhD. And thanks as always for tuning in.